thanks, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, and in thinking about what aspects of my research um, this particular group might be most interested in, because I'm not sure um, all aspects of my research will be of interest to people, um, what I decided to do is focus on a, a theme that's kind of uh, gone through a number of different projects that I've worked on over the years. Um, and that theme has to do with how social environment influences survival uh, and reproduction. And so what you're actually going to be hearing about are kind of bits and pieces from several different uh, studies I've done. Uh, and so that kind of necessitates me um, kind of leaving out some of the um, other aspects of the projects that these came from. But if anyone has questions or wants to kind of hear more about them in the broader context, I'm happy to kind of discuss that either as we go or at the end. So one of uh, my uh, overarching research interests uh, is understanding how environmental conditions influence patterns of survival and reproduction. Uh, and I think probably for most of this, um, we kind of understand this uh, intuitively that environmental conditions matter. Uh, so for example, uh, in this uh, great tit here and many other uh, insectivorous songbirds, uh, food availability, so for these guys it's uh, insect availability, can really have profound if effects on reproductive success. Uh, and these guys actually time their reproduction to a coincide with peaks in insect availability. Uh, uh, so food availability is important. Uh, predation can also be important as well. Uh, so predators uh, can impact their prey populations both through direct predation uh, but also through what are often termed risk effects. So where the threat of predation may cause some alteration in the behavior of the prey animals that then can impact uh, aspects of their survival and reproduction. So food availability, uh, predation are both important. Uh, and I think a number of people in this room would also probably recognize that social environment uh, is really important. Uh, and so, for example, uh, Joan's work on the baboons has shown that uh, social integration has, uh, within a social group is really important uh, in terms of female reproductive success. And so today, I'm going to be focusing on the role of the social environment. I'm going to do this from two different perspectives. Uh, the first uh, one is going to be talking about some work I've done with spotted hyenas uh, and looking at what you can kind of think of as more a direct uh, social influences on survival and reproduction in this species. And then for the second part of my talk, I'm going to talk about some more recent work I've done looking at how social cues, or you can think about this as social information, uh, influences reproductive timing in birds. And I'm working with pine siskins, this small finch here, uh, for this work. Uh, and in terms of how this relates to fitness, appropriate reproductive timing is really critical for the reproductive success of uh, organisms. And I'll explain that in more detail. Uh, but so here we're talking about the effects of social influences on reproductive timing, which then in turn will determine reproductive success. Right at the outset, I'd just like to uh, mention some of my key collaborators for this work. Uh, so the spotted hyena research I'm going to be talking about today um, was done, has been done with Kay Holkamp. Uh, and also Jamie Tanner has done uh, some of the work I'm going to show you today. Uh, and then for my pine siskin research, uh, this work's been done with Tom Hahn at UC Davis. Uh, and Chelsea Siminoff is an undergraduate at UC Davis who did a lot of the behavioral analysis associated with the pine uh, siskin work. Uh, so I'll begin by talking about uh, spotted hyenas uh, and what we know uh, from the work I've done there. So I'm going to talk about three types of what I'm grouping as social influences um, on spotted hyena reproduction and survival. I'm going to begin by talking about the role of social status or social rank in hyenas. Uh, I'll then talk about some work looking at the role of maternal support. And then I'll finish up by uh, considering the effect of group size here. So some of you guys might be pretty familiar with hyenas, but I'm going to do some basic hyena biology uh, for those of you that are less familiar. Uh, so spotted hyenas are uh, large, gregarious carnivores. Uh, unlike most carnivores, which are solitary or live in small family groups, spotted hyenas live in large, complex social groups. We call them clans uh, that can be as large as 90 uh, animals. These, uh, these social groups, although they're um, kind of more primate-like than really carnivore-like, hyenas are carnivores, 
Uh, they feed primarily on large to medium bodied ungulates that they primarily kill themselves. Uh, and these kills or carcasses represent rich but ephemeral food sources. And so consequently, you have really intense competition uh, to access food at these carcasses. So um, this, here we've only got about uh, five or six animals gaz gathered feeding uh, on this zebra carcass, but these uh, animals can become much more numerous such that you could have you know, 30 animals here all competing to access um, this carcass. Uh, and so feeding competition uh, from the perspective of a hyena can occur at several different levels. So we can get feeding competition within clans, so groups belonging, uh, individuals belonging to the same social group, such as here, will compete for access to food. We can also get competition between clans uh, for food, either uh, direct competition for a kill or competition for territory and the prey contained within it. Uh, and then also, hyenas will compete with lions for food. Uh, so lions are hyenas' main competitor. Uh, lions will steal food from hyenas, but hyenas can also steal food from lions. Uh, and later in the talk, I'll touch on all three types of feeding competition um, that hyenas engage in. So within clans, uh, I mentioned that these are, uh, the structure of these clans uh, is more typical of primates, particularly Cercopithecine primates, uh, than other carnivores. Uh, and clans are structured by linear dominance hierarchies, uh, such that each hyena uh, has a rank position within the clan and that social rank will determine their priority of access to food. Uh, so, for example, you can see here we've got higher ranking females would be, or animals would be the ones feeding, lower ranking animals the ones around the periphery. Uh, rank within the dominance hierarchy is inherited from the mother. Uh, so cubs inherit the rank directly <coughs> below their mother. So I'm showing you, this is just an uh, abbreviated dominance hierarchy for one of our study clans. I'm only showing you 10 animals. There'd be um, closer to 60 uh, here. But what you can see is every animal's numbered one, uh, in this case through 10, with number one by convention being given to the highest ranking animal, uh, in this case, Jaja. Uh, and so when Jaja has a cub, uh, Smith, Smith is going to inherit the rank directly below her. Uh, and so the Smith will then maintain position number two as long as he stays in the clan. Both males and females inherit the rank from their mother and will maintain that rank when, as long as they stay uh, within their natal clan. Females are philopatric, so they stay within their clan for their entire lives and maintain the rank they inherited from their mother. Males, on the other hand, will disperse at adulthood. And when males disperse, they behave submissively to all new hyenas they encounter. So this is a uh, dispersing male here behaving very submissively to this uh, new hyena, who you can hopefully see is much smaller and also younger animal uh, than this adult male. And so because of this, this behavioral change and this submissive behavior, males enter a new hierarchy when they join a new clan at the very bottom. So although Smith was number two in the clan he was born in, when he joins a new clan, he'll slot in at the very bottom of the hierarchy. What this creates is a rather unusual social organization among adult animals within a clan. And so what you can see here is what results is the breeding females uh, within a clan, uh, one through seven here, are higher ranking than our breeding males, our uh, immigrant adult males. And so consequently, hyenas have this rather unusual social organization among mammals in which females are dominant uh, to males in adulthood. So the data I'm going to be presenting to you today come from one very well studied group of hyenas uh, in the Maasai Mara National Reserve. So Maasai Mara is located here in southern Kenya. Uh, it forms the northern tip of the Mara Serengeti ecosystem. And a single large clan called the Talak clan has been studied there in great detail since 1988. Uh, Kay Holkamp has been working on them. And these hyenas were actually studied prior to that by Lawrence Frank in the 70s. And so we have a wealth of information on these animals spanning multiple generations. And so I'm going to be uh, exploiting those, that wealth of information uh, to look at patterns of reproduction survival today. 
So within the Talat clan, all individuals are individually known and recognized based on unique spot patterns. And we can make daily observations of these animals. So for example, we collect data on the outcome of agonistic interactions between pairs of individuals. Uh, and based on these data, and at any given time, we can know the, the dominance hierarchy within the clan. This also means we can monitor individuals from birth uh, throughout the course of their lives. So females give birth to uh, young cubs, you can see here, uh, in isolated natal dens. Uh, the cubs will then at some point move to a communal den, but the cubs will reside in the relative safety of the den for the first eight to nine months of life. At this point, uh, they'll leave the den, they'll move about and live within the clan's territory, but even after they've left the, the den, they're still dependent on their mother for milk. And so uh, cubs will nurse until they're somewhere between 12 and 18 months of age, at which point they're weaned. In this particular population, 13 to 14 months of age is the typical age of weaning for cubs. Once they're weaned, they're going to have to forage ind independently uh, in this rather competitive feeding environment. By 24 months of age, two years, uh, hyenas have gone through puberty and have reached sexual maturity, and females will begin to breed for the first time, typically between two to three years of age. Males, on the other hand, will disperse and join a new clan beginning at two years of age. Uh, so because males are dispersing and joining new clans, it makes it very challenging for us to follow their fates beyond dispersal. So most of the data I'm going to show you today are based on females who stay in the study clan and we have detailed information uh, beyond whence they reach adulthood. So I'm going to start by talking about uh, social status and how social status impacts reproduction and survival. So we know from uh, K. Holkamp's early work uh, and that of others that social rank has a profound influence on reproduction in this species. So here I'm showing you the relationship between social rank, uh, and remember by convention one is the highest ranking female, larger numbers are lower ranking females, and the age at first partrition, so when females begin breeding. And what you can see is we have this very strong relationship where higher ranking females begin breeding at younger ages compared to lower ranking females. Once females begin breeding, uh, higher ranking females will also produce more cubs than do lower ranking females. Uh, and so this is the number of offspring produced per year, and we have a, a significant negative relationship here where lower ranking females produce more offspring per year than their lower ranking counterparts. Uh, and so as a graduate student coming in uh, to work on the hyenas, we knew that uh, social rank had this important effect on reproduction, and I was really interested to see whether we also f uh, found effects of social rank on survival. Uh, and I think in the past, in the animal literature, there's been a real emphasis on understanding the relationship between social behavior um, and various reproductive parameters, so for example, mating success. Uh, but we know that survival is also an important fitness component. Uh, we know from Jones' work, for example, uh, that social factors have an important impact on infant survival. Um, and some of the human health literature has also emphasized this. But I think it's an area that, uh, by and large, has been neglected a bit in the animal literature. So I was interested to see you know, what, what, how does social rank influence survival. Uh, and not surprisingly, uh, we do find important effects here. So what I'm showing you, this is data on females uh, and their survival going out to about 13 years of age here. Uh, this is the proportion of offspring born in our study that uh, survive uh, to, to these ages. Uh, and I've grouped these animals into thirds of the dominance hierarchy. So the highest third, the mid-ranking third, and the lowest ranking third of the hierarchy. And we find a significant effect of social rank on survival. And hopefully what you can see is that it seems to be the lowest ranking females here that really seem to be faring poorly compared to high and mid-ranking females who are surviving much better. Uh, so we can say that social rank does have uh, a significant effect on survival. In looking at survivorship patterns, uh, I was interested in uh, what 
uh, life history events in the lives of hyenas might be particularly challenging uh, for animals. And so what we did is we looked at three life history events that we thought might be potentially challenging for these animals. Uh, we looked at den independence. So remember, that's when hyenas are leaving the relative safety of the den. They're moving out in the uh, clan's territory. They're potentially encountering uh, new environments, new circumstances that they're unfamiliar with. Weaning is also a potentially challenging period. At this point, hyenas, uh, young hyenas have to uh, forage on their independently, fend for themselves uh, in terms of obtaining food. Uh, so this could be a challenging period as well. And then the last period I included is uh, sexual maturity. And so it might not be entirely intuitive why uh, reaching sexual maturity might be challenging for hyenas. Uh, and so the context for that is that in the hyena literature, particularly coming out of captive studies, uh, it was thought that uh, the first time a female uh, breeds uh, and gives birth was potentially very um, dangerous, potentially life-threatening for females. So I told you that females are dominant to males, and so we often refer to this as they are behaviorally masculinized, uh, but females are also morphologically masculinized. So female spotted hyenas, uh, have a masculinized genitalia, they have a pseudopenis, uh, and their birth canal uh, is, has a rather unusual morphology. It makes um, a hairpin turn, it's rather long, uh, the fetus has to actually pass through um, this pseudopenis structure which has to tear the first time females give birth, and consequently, consequently uh, the fetus can actually be, become lodged um, in the birth canal during this process. Uh, and so it was thought that there might be a uh, high mortality of both mothers uh, and infants due to complications the first time a female breeds. And so that's why uh, we looked at sexual maturity as well. Uh, and so the data I'm showing you here is we've got mortality rate in the months following each of these events. So in the months following den independence, weaning, and sexual maturity. Uh, and I've shown this dotted line represents mean mortality in hyenas during the first year of age. And so what I think you can see is that, first of all, we don't find that sexual maturity um, is challenging, life-threatening for female hyenas. And I'd be happy to talk about this data more if you're interested. But I want to focus instead here on den independence and weaning. So den independence does, uh, we do see this uh, jump in mortality following den independence, suggesting that this is a challenging event. But in particular, you can see there's this rather large uh, increase in mortality rates following weaning. So weaning seems to be really uh, potentially challenging for these young hyenas. And so we were interested in whether social rank might influence survival during this period following weaning. Uh, so here I'm showing you the proportion of offspring surviving in the months following weaning uh, for high and low ranking uh, animals. So here I've just divided the dominance hierarchy into half, our sample sizes are a little bit smaller, uh, but, again, but again, we see this as a significant effect where high-ranking animals are surviving better than their lower-ranking counterparts following weaning. Um, and this effect seems to be particularly in about the first uh, eight to ten months following weaning. I'll point out that eight to ten months after weaning, that's when these hyenas are typically reaching sexual maturity and starting to breed. Uh, so it's leveled off by that point. So we see this effect um, of social rank on weaning, and this at weaning, and this makes sense if we think about these higher-ranking cubs are the ones that have priority access to food it kills. Um, so they're probably better able to access food um, than their lower-ranking counterparts during this challenging period. So to summarize a little bit, um, some of these results and other wor work that's been done uh, in spotted hyenas. To, to really bring out how important social rank is for fitness in these animals. Uh, so female social rank, I, I've told you, it determines priority of access to food resources. Uh, I haven't told you yet, but it also influences energy output that these uh, animals expend. Uh, for example, traveling to find food and so on and so forth. Lower ranking animals travel greater distances, expend more energy than do higher ranking animals. Um, these two factors together probably uh, con contribute or generate these effects on reproduction and survival that we're seeing, where high-ranking females um, breed earlier uh, in their life, they have shorter interbirth intervals, 
uh, they produce more offspring, and those offspring survive better. Uh, these life history consequences uh, may have important impacts on social structure um, in these clans as well. Uh, and so uh, Jen Smith, who's here, has done some work looking at uh, what, what's happening in terms of the social structure. But we know, for example, that these high mid-ranking matrilines uh, are going to accumulate a lot of individuals and come to dominate the clans numerically relative to lower ranking animals, for example. So hopefully I've convinced you social rank is really important for these animals. Uh, and I want to step back and talk about weaning a little bit more and why weaning is so challenging um, and why rank matters. And so uh, this is work that has been done primarily uh, by Jamie Tanner, who I mentioned at the outset. Um, and you know, it seems obvious that you know, social rank is important, better access to food. Uh, but the story is actually a little bit more complex than that. Uh, and so if you, those of you that went to Kay Holcamp's talk when she was here a few years ago may have seen this slide and know a little bit about this. Uh, but so spotted hyenas, uh, their feeding apparatus, their skulls, the musculature associated with feeding uh, takes a relatively long period of time to develop. So we say that uh, the development is, uh, is prolonged compared to other carnivores. And so if you look here, so this is a skull from a hyena at three months of age. Uh, this is when the hyena would still be living at the den. This is a hyena at 13 months of age, typically when hyenas in this population wean. This is an animal at sexual maturity, two years. Uh, and then here's an animal who's 11 years old. And what you can probably see just looking at this image is that these skulls from the three month old to the 24 month old still look quite different than this skull of an 11 year old animal. And so Jamie went in and did uh, did some really detailed analyses to quantify um, the differences in the shape and size of these skulls uh, and also looked at, did some feeding tests to see how um, efficient animals of different ages are at, uh, at, at feeding. And what Jamie found was that spotted hyenas don't reach mature capabilities in terms of their feeding apparatus or feeding capabilities uh, until about 34 months of age. Uh, so when you think about that in the context of the life history of this animal, that means that when a cub's weaned, it's nowhere near mature capabilities. And even once an animal reaches sexual maturity and begins reproducing, she's still not um, fully mature in terms of her ability to uh, consume food and consume food rapidly in this intense feeding environment. Uh, so we've got this prolonged development of the feeding apparatus. So it's, in this context, it's not surprising that weaning is really challenging uh, because these animals don't necessarily have the capabilities to compete with other clan members at these kills. So I was interested in what other social factors might mitigate challenges after weaning. And so uh, we were interested in whether maternal support might be important, important after weaning. Uh, and so from the literature, it's been reported uh, and anecdotally observed that mothers are observed to um, aid their adult offspring in feeding competition. So for, this is uh, where you see an adult female um, aiding and defending an adult offspring during feeding competition so that animal can feed. So for example, here we've got, this is Eve, this is an alpha female in one of our study clans, and she's basically standing around keeping other animals at bay while her two adult offspring uh, feed here. And so this anecdotally suggested that uh, mothers might routinely engage in behaviors where they're helping their offspring secure access to food. And so that's a type of maternal support that they could find, uh, provide. Uh, that would be very useful. Uh, and so what I did to look at this is, uh, I'm not looking at the specific behavior of the mothers here, but instead what I'm looking at is how does having your mother around, present in the clan, influence your survival in, after weaning? And so what we did here is we looked at animals whose mothers either were alive in the six months after they were weaned, or their mothers had died in the six months after they were weaned. So I want to be really clear, all of these animals were successfully weaned um, with their mother still alive, and then in the period following that, in some cases, the mothers uh, had died. And so we can compare these animals. Here you can see when the mothers were present and when the mothers were absent 
uh, and the proportion surviving in the months after weaning. And we find a significant effect here where the presence of the mother uh, is associated with higher survivorship than when the mother is absent. Uh, and so these are individuals, uh, so this suggests that maternal support uh, is really important for survival in this challenging time. I'll point out that if we do this, look at the same relationship in hyenas once they've reached mature capabilities, so after 36 months of age, we don't find this relationship. So this, once hyenas are able um, to, to, to feed uh, as, as an adult, they don't seem to need the maternal support uh, in the same way they do during this period following weaning. Uh, so the implications of this are that for social rank and maternal support influence patterns of survival in spotted hyenas, particularly after weaning. Uh, and these relationships suggest that female dominance in this species uh, may have evolved as a mechanism by which females can actually secure food access for their developmentally handicapped offspring, so handicapped by their immature um, feeding apparatus, during uh, intense feeding competition that is characteristic in this species. So the last topic with uh, hyenas that I wanted to talk about was the role of group size. Um, so here I'm talking about dynamics within the group, uh, but broadly, you know, as a hyena, does it matter if you're in a large or small group? Uh, what impact does that have? Uh, so this work came out of some work I was doing looking at uh, variation in uh, hyena demographic patterns from this longitudinal study. So what I'm showing you here is, uh, on the top graph, is the rate of reproduction. So this is the number of offspring produced per female uh, for 15 years of the study. Uh, and this is the recruitment rate. This is the number of offspring uh, born that reached uh, two years of age during each year of the study. And what you can see is these numbers fluctuate across years. And so I was interested to see uh, if we could explain this variation we see uh, across years of our study. And so I've looked at this in relation to, to a number of ecological variables. Uh, so we've looked at this in relationship to prey availability, uh, competition with lions, uh, anthropogenic disturbance, rainfall. Uh, but I'm only going to uh, present the group size data for you today. Uh, so what I did is I looked at how do birth rates compare with group size across years. Uh, and so this graph that I'm showing you uh, is controlling for other variables that we know that are important. So we know that prey availability influences birth rates, and we also know that competition with lions influences birth rates. So I've taken that into account, um, and what you can see is that we get this significant positive relationship. Uh, where being uh, a member of a larger clan is associated with higher birth rates than smaller clans. Uh, and this is birth rate per female, so we've taken into account that there are more females in larger clans. Uh, so this is a significant effect. We don't find a relationship between uh, group size and recruitment, uh, so that, that juvenile recruitment. It's just an effect on birth rates. So why might birth rates be higher in larger clans? Um, so we have two possible explanations. Uh, the first is that larger clans might be better able to compete against other clans. Uh, and so they might be able to secure uh, larger territories uh, with more abundant food sources. Or in actual uh, conflicts over individual carcasses, they may be able to overpower neighboring clans. Uh, a second explanation, and these aren't mutually exclusive, uh, is that larger clans might be better able to compete against lions. Uh, and a piece of evidence uh, suggesting that this is important comes from some work I've done uh, comparing population, comparing across populations. Uh, and so when we look at differences between hy hyena populations uh, in reproduction, we can attribute differences in reproduction to differences in the degree of competition with lions. Uh, and what seems to be important here is food scavenging. Uh, so when hyenas are able to scavenge more food from lions, uh, then they're able to, uh, to achieve higher birth rates. Uh, and you, with larger clans, you might be better able to um, win in fights against lions because the outcome of lion-hyena interactions is really uh, determined largely by relative numbers of hyenas to lions. 
Uh, so to summarize some of this work really broadly, uh, hopefully I've shown you that a variety of social factors influence survival uh, and reproduction in spotted hyenas, uh, and that a key element or theme throughout these seems to be that um, the relationship to food access. Uh, so whether that be um, competition for access to food within a clan or potentially the clan's ability to secure access to food uh, in competition with other clans or with lions, um, that these, these social factors and their relationship to food seem to be really important. So for the second part of my talk, uh, I'm going to shift gears a little bit here and now discuss how social cues or social information can influence reproductive timing um, in pine siskins. And so pine siskins are a, a small finch, uh, and they are interesting for a variety of reasons, but for our purposes, uh, they're a highly gregarious bird. Um, they'll aggregate in large groups. Um, and they're also a bird that breeds on a, a, what I call a flexible schedule. So they are a temperate zone bird, but they can breed over about six months of the year. Um, they don't have a really strict short breeding schedule. They can be more flexible in when they actually breed. So I got into this uh, work because I was interested in how animals appropriately time events in their annual cycle. Uh, and so particularly how they time breeding to occur when conditions are likely to be suitable for success. So what I'm showing you here uh, is a typical annual schedule for uh, a temperate zone North American songbird. So most of these animals will have a period of the year when they breed, uh, a period of year when they molt, so they shed their feathers and grow new feathers. Uh, they have some what we call an overwintering or non-breeding time. Uh, and then in a number of species, they'll also fit in migration uh, into that annual schedule as well. Uh, so there are a lot of events that need to be coordinated within the year. Uh, often these are incompatible, so an animal uh, can't be breeding and migrating simultaneously. Uh, and these have to be timed so that they occur uh, when conditions are appropriate for that event. So breeding, for example, typically occurs in the spring and summer when food is available. Uh, failure to time breeding appropriately uh, can have disastrous consequences both for that particular reproductive event but also for um, the parent's survival and future reproduction. Uh, so for example, if breeding is timed too early, uh, that breeding attempt is likely to fail. Uh, and if breeding occurs too late, uh, the animal risks, for example, not being able to complete molt in time for winter or migration in addition to the fact that conditions may also just be unsuitable for rearing young. Uh, so appropriate timing uh, is important, and a uh, question. Is there, also, sorry, is there also an advantage to coordinating with conspecifics? Uh, so there is potentially. So it may, be, it may be useful to coordinate with conspecifics if, for example, um, predation pressure you know, is high, and so you know, numerically it might be advantage, advantageous to produce all your young simultaneously. Um, a lot of what at least we think is driving this, is food availability for a lot of species. Um, and so consequently, a lot of animals use cues in their environment in order to orchestrate um, the transitions and timing of these events. Uh, so in songbirds, I just want to tell you a little bit about reproductive physiology um, and how what associated with seasonal breeding. Uh, and so this diagram illustrates kind of what happens over the course of a year uh, for these birds in terms of reproduction. So here you can see months of the year. Uh, and so these birds will have a non-breeding period, an overwintering period, which is illustrated here. Um, and at this point, their gonads are regressed. So they are um, small in size. They're not producing gametes. Uh, and then in preparation for breeding, they'll undergo this period of what we term reproductive development, where they grow the gonads, um, so testes in males, ovary in female, uh, they produce gametes, uh, they can then breed, and then following breeding, they go through this period of termination in which they regress the gonads again and enter this non-breeding state. Uh, so this looks very similar to what you would see at puberty, so going from immature to mature gonads, but I want to highlight for you that this is happening in adult birds on an annual basis. They're going through this cycle. Uh, and so in terms of studying uh, the effects of environmental cues on this transition, 
they're a nice system because they have these very conspicuous changes that we can measure um, and study to see when they're transitioning. And I'll use the term reproductive development here to refer to this transition. Um, and I just like to remind people um, who, are not, who don't work with birds that even though I'm using the term development, this is adult animals that are doing this. This isn't going from juvenile state to adulthood. Okay, so as I said, uh, typically animals use environmental cues to time these transitions. Uh, and the best studied of such cues is photo period, so day length. And so typically what happens is as days become longer, uh, that serves as a cue to initiate the transition from a non-breeding to a breeding state uh, in preparation for um, spring or summer breeding. The way this works mechanistically uh, is that uh, day length, is, as the cue is perceived in the brain of these birds, uh, and this stimulates the hypothalamus uh, within the brain to release a hormone called gonadotropin-releasing hormone, GnRH. Uh, GnRH then acts on the anterior pituitary uh, to stimulate release of luteinizing hormone, LH, and follicle-stimulating hormone, FSH. These hormones then act on the gonads, uh, first of all, to stimulate development of the gonads, uh, to stimulate production of gametes, uh, but also to stimulate the production of testosterone and estradiol that then in turn further uh, coordinate gonadal development but also act elsewhere in the body to orchestrate uh, behavioral and morphological changes associated with reproduction as well. Um, I walk you through this because I'm going to be showing you um, some data from, on luteinizing hormone um, and testosterone in birds. And so these are, all, these are hormones that are associated with this transition to breeding condition. So, as I said, we know that photo period causes these changes, we know it's important, but there are potentially a whole bunch of other cues that are also really important um, for proper reproductive timing. timing. Uh, so food availability, water availability or rainfall, uh, temperature, uh, and social interactions or social information may also all be important cues used to time reproduction. Uh, and so one of my research interests has been in better understanding the role of these cues in reproductive timing. So as I said, this work's been done, I'm doing this work in pine siskins. They're a North American songbird. You can see their distribution here. Uh, they're typically found in con coniferous forests, often at higher elevations. Uh, and they can breed from May through August. Uh, this is this flexible breeding that I mentioned, where we find from year to year there's vari variation in the time that breeding actually occurs. So in some years they may breed earlier in March, other years it might be later breeding in August. Uh, and it's been suggested that this variation is related at least in part uh, to variation in food availability. As I mentioned earlier, they're also highly social. Uh, them and some of their relatives that are these really gregarious um, there are indications, or we think that social interaction, social information may be really important um, in organizing a number of aspects of the lives of these animals. So today, uh, what I'm going to present are research looking at the relationship between social cues and reproductive, in, reproductive timing uh, in pine siskins. I've also been looking at uh, the role of food cues uh, in them as well, if you're interested in that. So the first question I'm going to address is, do pines Siskins use social cues, um, and I'm using a relatively crude social cue here, uh, just the presence or absence of a potential mate, uh, to time the transition to breeding. Uh, and then I'm also going to ask whether males and females differ in their responsiveness to, responsiveness to social cues. Uh, so in this field, typically research is done on males. I'm discovering that's because they're a lot easier to work with. Um, and we kind of assume that whatever we find in males is broadly applicable um, to other species, or if we work in females that, not other species, the other sex. So what we find in females applies to males, vice versa. Uh, but uh, I think it's important that we start considering whether the sexes uh, may be using cues differently. So I'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, so to do this work, uh, I use wild caught birds. So I go out to the field, catch birds, and then bring them back into the laboratory uh, where we can actually um, control and manipulate what environmental cues they have as they transition from wintering to breeding. Uh, so this is the, what our experimental setup looks like. Um, we can have birds um, in cages in different chambers that experience either the same or different conditions. 
And so the experimental design I'm going to be um, presenting today, we've got birds that are housed um, without a mate, so my no mate category. And so we've got males housed without a mate, and we've got females housed without a mate. And then we've also got birds that are um, paired. I may use the term mated. That doesn't imply that they've actually copulated, but just that they've been paired with an opposite sex bird. And those uh, are my mated birds. Those birds are randomly assigned a partner. Uh, so just randomly assigned males and females. So it's a potential mate. It may or may not be a bird that that animal is actually interested in as a potential mate. Uh, and I'll get to that. And then I have actually have a fourth group here that I want to tell you about. Uh, and so these are also paired birds. Uh, but in this pair, my females have estradiol implants. Uh, and so the purpose of this manipulation is to create females who are going to behave as reproductively mature active females uh, so that they are uh, maximally stimulatory um, for these males in this experiment. And so I'll show you some data from them. So we, we put the birds in these conditions. Um, we uh, simulate a change in photo period going from winter to spring. Um, and then we look at what the effect is on reproduction. Uh, and we measure reproduction or reproductive condition with a variety of measures. Uh, so in males, one of the things we look at is um, gonadal condition and specifically testis length. Um, and we can do this in uh, alive, intact birds uh, through a small surgical procedure called a laparotomy, where we make a small incision into the body cavity. We can actually go in and measure the size of the testes. Uh, and so you can see here, um, these are regressed testes of an immature male. Um, and this is what they look like in a male that's pretty close to becoming reproductively mature. Uh, we can also collect repeated blood samples to measure circulating levels of luteinizing hormone, uh, circulating levels of plasma, testosterone. Uh, and then we, I also measure a secondary sexual trait, uh, which is cloacal protuberance. So this is the cloacal protuberance here on this male bird. Um, and this is a structure that becomes larger during the breeding season. season. It's used for sper st the sperm storage and sperm transfer. Uh, and it's a testosterone-dependent trait. So it's, uh, increasing testosterone levels uh, lead to the development of an enlarged cloacal protuberance. So in females, uh, we measure reproductive uh, condition using a variety of similar measures. So we can measure gonadal condition directly in the females. Uh, I'm going to present data on an ovary score. So this is a, a well-developed uh, ovary here. You can see these follicles. This is a yoked follicle. Um, and they get scored from one uh, undeveloped to six, which is um, yoking up and laying eggs. Uh, in females, I'll present some ovary mass data as well. We can uh, get these data if we sacrifice the birds and we actually can weigh the ovary. Uh, we measure plasma LH levels in our females through blood samples. Uh, and then we also measure a secondary sexual trait in the females, which is the brood patch score. So this is the chest of a female uh, bird here. And you can see it's bare. She's dropped the feathers um, from her chest. This is what we call the brood patch. Uh, this is, happens in preparation for incubating eggs. So they use the brood patch to incubate the eggs. And we can measure the percent of the brood patches that's defeathered. Uh, and this is an estradiol dependent trait. So as estradiol levels increase, we get defeathering of the brood patch. We will also show, show, you, show you some data on egg laying. Uh, so we actually, these females will progress to laying eggs, and we can uh, quantify whether or not a female progressed to egg laying or not. So I'll present my male data first, and I'll walk you through the layout of this graph, because I'm going to show you several in the same format. So on the y-axis, I've got my measure of reproductive condition, in this case, testis length. And then on the x-axis is day of the experiment. So day zero is the day uh, that males uh, and females were paired, or for the, uh, for the animals housed alone, they were kept alone. Uh, and so what you can see, hopefully, is that we found no effect of our social treatment on testis length in our males. Uh, and so males had already initiated reproductive development at the start of the experiment. Uh, so at, in the dead of winter, they'd be down here at about one millimeter. Um, they've initiated it. And we can see that the males continue to increase uh, their testis size. And in fact, towards the air, end of the experiment, they're starting to regress the gonads. So they're terminating reproduction. So we've captured the entire 
period um, from reproductive development to actually they're initiating reproductive termination and we find no effect of our treatment. So we've got our uh, males alone, our males paired with females that were unmanipulated, and even our estradiol implanted females that should be maximally uh, stimulatory to these males uh, generated no effect. I won't show you the data, but I can tell you, I'll tell you that we also found no effect on luteinizing hormone levels, on testosterone levels, or on the cloacal protuberance among our treatment groups. So males are not uh, attending to the presence or absence of a potential mate uh, here. On the female side of things, we do see an effect. So here I'm showing you ovary score. One is a completely regressed ovary. It kind of looks like a gray pyramidal structure. And then five and six are females that have um, a hierarchy of follicles. They're yoking up follicles. Um, and six are females who are actually uh, laying eggs. And so what you can see here is that we have a trend for mated females to have uh, higher ovary scores than our unmated females. Um, so, so these are relatively small sample sizes, our P's uh, 0.067. Um, but what seems to be the distinction that we see is that the unpaired females aren't progressing to yolk deposition. So while we have our paired females are going, uh, going on and depositing yolk and laying eggs, our, females, our unpaired females don't get to that yolk deposition stage. If we look at plasma LH levels in these guys, um, at the very start of ex the experiment, our LH levels are very low. They're below the detection limit of our assay, uh, but by about 30 days here, um, we can quantify LH levels. Uh, and if we take an integrated measure of LH uh, secretion or LH levels, uh, which is the total LH secreted over the course of the experiment, what we find is that mated females or paired females have significantly higher LH levels than do our unpaired females. When we look at the brood patch score, we, seen this, we th see the same pattern. So this is the percent of the brood patch that's been defeathered. And what you can see is that our paired females uh, have significantly higher brood patch scores than do our unpaired females. And so remember, this is an estradiol dependent trait. And so we can actually think of this as an integrated measure of estradiol in these birds over the course of the experiment as well. So in indicating that our, uh, our paired females uh, ha would have had higher estradiol levels as well. Uh, and if we look at which, whether females actually went on to completely defeather the brood patch, um, five of our eight paired females did. So this would be what happens um, immediately preceding incubation of eggs. Um, and only one of our, um, of our unpaired females actually completely defeathered her brood patch. Uh, so hopefully uh, I've shown you that the presence of a mate uh, enhances reproductive development in females, but not in males. And so I think this is important for us to start thinking about these sex differences um, in terms of the, the response of animals to environmental cues. Uh, the last uh, result I want to tell you about is some work looking at what, what the relationship of those pairs uh, might actually um, mean in terms of their effect on reproductive development. And so I told you that I randomly paired birds, and we know when we randomly pair these birds, we end up with birds with a range of um, relationships. So we get some birds that are highly affiliative. Um, they show uh, behaviors associated with pair bonding, and we other, get other birds that are much less affiliative, that don't seem to show those same relationships. Uh, and so what we did is for um, all the birds in our experiment, we quantified the degree of affiliation for each pair. And I'm going to show you a short video of what this affiliative behavior looks like. So you're going to see two behaviors that we quantified. We quantified what's called bill touching, which is just what it sounds like. You'll see it. Uh, and so the frequency of bill touching and also the proportion of time that birds spent perched together. And so we combine these into a single composite measure um, of affiliation or affiliation score. So here's some bill touching. And then also these birds are perching together. And 
And so these behaviors aren't exclusively associated with reproduction, uh, but they are characteristic of birds uh, pair bonding. So when we create, uh, we, when we score affiliative behaviors and we uh, have a score of birds either being more or less affiliative, so larger numbers indicate higher degrees of affiliation, lower numbers indicate lower degrees of affiliation, we can actually then look at how these birds compare in terms of their reproductive physiology, reproductive condition. Uh, and the data I'm showing you here is based on whether or not females went on to lay eggs. So these are all paired birds um, and whether or not they laid eggs or not. And what you can see is the females who laid eggs are significantly more in significantly more affiliative pairs that the than the females that did not lay eggs. Um, I'll point out for those of you that do work with birds, I did not give these birds nest cups, nesting material, um, nothing to induce um, egg laying. I actually didn't necessarily think they were going to do it. Um, but these birds went ahead and they laid eggs um, in their food cups. Uh, and so we were able uh, to, to get information on um, on egg laying. Uh, so what this suggests is that um, not only does the presence of a mate matter in terms of uh, the social cue and the effect on reproductive physiology, but who the mate is is important. And so the effect of that mate may be, may be modulated by the degree of affiliation um, of the pair. Uh, and again, I think this, oh, well, so I didn't show you the data, but when we look in males, affiliation doesn't matter. So whether the male is paired with a, an opposite sex bird that he affiliates with or not, it has no effect on his reproductive physiology, but it does in females. So again, I think we really need to be considering sex differences um, in their response to environmental cues. Uh, so to summarize, uh, hopefully I've shown you from two very different uh, social animals how various aspects of the social environment can influence survival and reproduction, um, including reproductive timing, which remember um, is an important element of reproductive success uh, in birds. And so with that, I'd like to acknowledge uh, a number of uh, people who are involved in this research, funding agencies, uh, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. <laughs>